it's great to have Roy Blount Jr. back at Politics and Prose Bookstore. Uh, Roy has written 24 books, and the topics of his books now cover just about everything in the world. Um, but if you, if you don't know him by his books, perhaps you rec recognize his voice from his appearances as a, as a regular panelist on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And in today's book, Save Room for Pie, Roy Blount Jr. writes about food the same way he writes about everything else, with humor, insight, honesty, and a palpable affection for the reader. So please welcome Roy Blount Jr. Thank you, Bill. Uh, here it's going to snow tomorrow. Well, it's not my fault. There are a lot of things going on around here that are not my fault, and that's one of them. I'm not even going to vote for them when the chance comes. Um, I, uh, this book is um, not really a how-to book. You know, it's not one of those. It would never be entitled. Maybe what you're eating is what's been eating you, or anything like that. Uh, I, I don't, uh, you know, I grew up eating, I will read some uh, sort of uh, evocations of the spirit in which I grew up, which was to eat as much as possible, and uh, to enjoy it as much as possible. And I don't want to lose track of that gusto, but meanwhile, of course, you've got to worry about the planet and your health. I don't think it's a good idea to eat primarily for health. It's sort of like uh, marrying for money. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's not crazy, but it's um, <laughs> unless you start out with, uh, in either case, with the, an element of yum, uh, it's not going to go very far, I think. <laughs> so um, I've tried to take into account things like, uh, you know, uh, grass, uh, grass raised beef instead of, uh, you know, which uh, leads me to be able to say that the harder something is to eat, the longer you get to taste it. <laughs> and, uh, but there's just a lot of stuff in here involving food in all sorts of ways. For instance, um, the, uh, that's not what I'm looking for. Well, I'll read this one. The um, wait, wait, don't tell me. They have these, you know, bl uh, uh, bluff the listener segments where the panelists make up false news stories to try to get uh, lure the um, caller into, uh, you know, choosing the fictional story. I've realized that a number of my bluffs involve food. For instance, this one, food of a sort, eating anyway. What do folks ingest these days when they're raving all night to techno pop? Benzodioxylmethylpropanamine, popularly known as Molly, or so I am told. But if an extra if an extra oxygen molecule slips in there, you've got benzotrioxyl, the accidental offshoot known as O Molly. <laughs> Whereas Molly makes you feel all ecstatic and rubbery, so I am told. O Molly induces an intense craving for weepy old Irish ballads. Understandably, O'Malley has caused havoc on club dance floors. <laughs> when you're gyrating to electro clash with the laser lights and all, the last thing you want is people standing there glaring at you and crooning Danny Boy, or worse. According to a study issued this week by the Drug Enforcement Administration, no fatal overdoses of O'Malley have been reported, but a Boston DJ was beaten and thrown through a plate glass window for refusing to sample my Cheek on Mother's Tattered Shawl, a song virtually impossible to twerk to. Uh, one thing I do in this book is to address certain foods that are scorned or disdained or, uh, but turn out to be actually good for you. For instance, uh, okra. Here, well, first I'll read the, uh, the column I wrote for Garden and Gun about, about okraphobia. When the rock and roll band of authors known as the Rock Bottom Remainders got together recently, I learned that my friend and bandmate Stephen King is horrified by okra. Someone, not me, maybe Greg Isles, the only other Southern member of the band, happened to bring up okra, just in passing, you know, as one will. <laughs> and Steve reacted, as another person might, to a vengeful psychokinetic wallflower or a runaway rabid St. Bernard, or an insanely jealous Plymouth Fury. No, he said, I don't want okra, no okra, no. 
Not an unusual response among people who didn't grow up with okra. Also among quite a few who did. <laughs> Even the definition in the Oxford English Dictionary sounds unsettling. Quote, a five-sided pod, actually a cop capsule, harvested when immature and mucilaginous. <laughs> also called ladies' fingers. To me, there's nothing, nothing much more savory than cross sections of okra dusted with cornmeal and crispy fried. But I like okra boil, too. Jerry Clower said the longest dog fight he ever saw was over okra. At his mama's behest, Jerry dumped a pot full of boiled down leftover okra into the dog pen. A big old hound run up there, and it just, it just went down so fast, he thought the other dog got it and jumped on him. Them dogs fought the whole rest of the evening and didn't but one dog know what they was fighting over. <laughs> okay, okra is slick, but can't we appreciate slick? Ernie K. Doe, according to Ben Sandmel's biography of the singer of Mother-in-Law, was proud to say, quote, I'm so slick, grease gotta come ask me how to be greasy. <laughs> In GQ recently, an MC named Two Chains was quoted as observing that Atlanta people always say slick when we really mean it. It's slick hot outside, for instance. Okra gets a bad rap, says Poppy Tooker, author of the Crescent, Crescent City Farmer's Market Cookbook on YouTube, where she demonstrates, quote, how to keep okra from getting slimy. Fry it in hot, hot oil. Someone from the Philippines has posted a comment. If you don't want your okra to be slimy, then go pick another vegetable, because it is made that way. <laughs> also on YouTube, Sarah Sawadogo, slickly hot in a little black off-the-shoulder dress and three strands of pearls, shows us, quote, how to cook okra the most delicious way. If the gumbo she stirs up involving octopus looks a little questionable, she sells it by tasting it so well, mmm, and then shouting, I see my grandmother. Comments range from, quote, I am from Louisiana, I love okra, it's good for the body, and yours look delicious, to, <laughs> I guess that means the okra looks as nice, <laughs> to, quote, Mo most delicious way, are you crazy? Look, whoever taught you to cook okra soup this way have wronged you big time, Miss Lady. Nonsense. And then, of course, another commenter has to blurt out, dirty, nasty, stankin'. Which bears out what another member of the Rock Bottom Remainders, Matt Groening, remarked when we were all in Los Angeles. Never read online comments, because about the fifth one down will make you hate all humans. <laughs> but okra runs deeper than commentary. In Ghana, okra is not only a dietary staple, but essential in other ways. There's a reggae hop band called, o called Okra, and a singer called Okra Tom David. And the word for a mess of okra is Nkrumah the name of Ghana's founder, Kwame Nkrumah. Do Ghana's dominant ethnic group is the Akan people. They believe, according to the Encyclopedia of African and African American Religions, that one of the three major spiritual components of a person is, quote, the immaterial divine spark from God that is immortal and so vital, so vital that life cannot be sustained without it. And that the word for that, quote, soul from God is okra. Quote, if a person is faced with intense disgrace or attacks by evil, the okra is believed to react by temporarily, temporarily leaving the person. In such a situation, certain rituals are required in order to restore the okra. I like the notion of, say, John Edwards having to woo his okra back. <laughs> I don't like thinking of the soul as slimy, but slick, yeah. And here is a song to okra. String beans are good and ripe tomatoes and collard greens and sweet potatoes, sweet corn, field peas, and squash and beets. But when a man, man rears back and eats, he wants okra. Good old okra. Oh, wow, okra. Yes, siree. Okra is okay with me. Oh, okra's favored far and wide. Oh, you can eat it boiled or fried. Oh, either slick or crisp inside. Oh, I once knew a man who died without okra. Little pepper sauce on it. Ooh, I want it. Okra. Old Homer Ogletree's so high on okra, he keeps lots laid by. He keeps it in a safe he locks up. He eats so much, can't keep his socks up. That was one of my father's two favorite jokes. 
But I knew a man once that ate so much okra he couldn't keep his socks up. <laughs> people started stop and think. <laughs> his other one made people stop and think even more, which was, you think I'm stupid? My brother used to walk like this. <laughs> brother was even more stupid. Uh, which goes to show it's no misnomer when people call him okra homer. That's Homer Ogletree, you may recall. Okra. Oh, you can make some gumbo with it, but most of all, I like to get it all by itself in its own juice. Lying there all green and loose. That's okra. It may be poor for eating chips with. It may be hard to come to grips with. But okra is such a wholesome food, it straightens out your attitude. You can have strip okra. Give me an ice girl and a dish of okra. Mmm is how discerning fokra spawn when they are served some okra. One of those rhymes that come to you in the night, and you just <laughs> either embrace it or you don't. I have some lyrics here, uh, limericks here, that uh, I like to write spicy limericks, and these so it turns out these involve food. A good cook, otherwise Ella, poo pooed so-called salmonella, till during her Jethro's consequent death throes. It struck her she'd need a new fella. Uh, a bait shop proprietor, Kate, tells Randy Fisherman, wait just a damn minute, your boat, go get in it and fish, because I ain't the bait. Uh, there once was a lady named, named Dot who said, as we found a nice spot, I never undress at a picnic unless it's warm. And it is, so why not? <laughs> um, at communion, a lady named Bev said to the minister, Rev, it's grape, it's grape juice, not wine. Would you like to have mine? And the cracker could use something, Chev. <laughs> Tonight, says my vegan friend Blanche, I'll be serving myself root and branch. And you can be guessing which mode of undressing, French, Thousand Island, or ranch. Uh, a, lady, a lady I know named Elaine finds all endeavors inane, but fucking and cooking. If you think I'm looking for anyone else, you're insane. <laughs> uh, here's another, um, another bluff story from Wait, Wait. It doesn't take long for a small morsel of fatty pork to pass through a duck. Alton Emery of Canardia, New Hampshire, who has ducks, noticed this. And it gave him an idea for a surefire viral video. He tied a piece of fatty pork to a greased length of twine and placed, placed, it on his duck, placed it in his duckyard, and soon he had a string of ducks going on with their lives unruffled because Emory allowed for adequate slack. But the video footage, four ducks, then five ducks, then six, didn't look like much. And the local Humane Society got wind of his project. project. Last week, as Emery stood in the yard arguing with the Humane Society guy, an eagle swooped down, grabbed the sixth duck, and flew off with the whole string. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it, as the other five ducks, one at a time, slid down the string, fell through the air, and landed on his pond, Emery's camera was in the house. <laughs> um, let's see what else I have marked here. Um, more, let's see, song to onions. They improve everything, pork chops to soup. And not only that, but each, each onion's a group. Peel back the skin, delve into tissue, and see how an onion has been blessed with issue. Every layer produces an ovum. You think you've got three, then you find you've got fovum. Onion on onion on onion they run, each but the smallest one some onion's mother. An onion comprises a half dozen other. Some then may say an onion is less than the sum of its parts. I'd say it's full of selves to express. In food or the arts, give me pungent, not Tony. I'll take Damon Runyon over Antonioni, who, if an eye wanders, becomes anti-onion. I'm anti baloney Uh, 
Well, here's one I wrote. It's, it has something in common, I guess, with the uh, okra, okra piece, but it's, uh, it's actually the only thing I ever wrote that I know by heart, so I'll render it in that way. Song to oysters. I like to eat an uncooked oyster. Nothing slicker, nothing's moister. Nothing's easier on your gorge or when the time comes to discharge. But not to let it too long rest within your mouth is always best. For if, a mind, if your mind dwells on an oyster, nothing's slicker, nothing's moister. I prefer my oysters fried. Then I'm sure my oysters died. <laughs> Here's a hymn to Ham. Though Ham was one of Noah's sons, like Jepheth, I can't see that Ham meant any more to him than Ham has meant to me. On Christmas Eve, I said, yes, ma'am, I do believe I'll have more ham. I said, yes, ma'am, I do believe I'll have more ham. I said, yes, ma'am, I do believe I'll have more ham. And then after dinner, my uncle said he was predominantly English but part Cherokee. As near as I can figure, I said, I am an eighth Scotch-Irish and seven-eighths ham. <laughs> ham, my soul. I took a big hot roll, put in some jam and butter that melted down in with the jam, which was blackberry jam, and a big old folded over oozy slice of ham, and my head swam. Ham, hit me with a hammer, wham, bam, bam. What good am I without my ham? Ham's substantial. Ham is fat. Ham is firm and sound. Ham's what God was getting at when he made pigs so round. <laughs> um, the title of this book is Save Room for Pie. And as I say, it's not a how-to book, but one, if you, I do make the uh, case that when you're eating french fries, say, you know the truth is that the first three french fries are the best. And after that, you're just stuffing your face with french fries. But... So you need to think of some way to stop and move on. But one way, of course, is to say, you fat fool, you're just going to make, you're going to regret this. All right, just go ahead and eat them all. Eat all the french fries. Go ahead. I don't care. Go ahead and eat them, which puts you in a bad relation with yourself. On the other hand, you can say, after the first three french fries, let's save room for pie. And uh, you can be thinking about pie. You don't even actually have to have any pie if you... Uh, just moves you all away from the French fry. Um, and so I've got several things in here about pie. Um, as it happens, here's a song to pie somewhere in here. Uh, pie. This actually, uh, I wrote this without it. I have all these songs to food, but that none of them had a tune except this one, which Nora, Ef Dora, Nora Ephron asked me, if she could uh, have this one set to music for her movie, Michael. Uh, which, so Andy McDowell sings this song. I, I can't carry even that tune. But she sings this song in the movie, Michael. Pie, oh my, nothing tastes sweet, wet, salty, and dry all at once, so well as pie. Apple and pumpkin and mints and black bottom, I'll come to your place every day if you've got them. Pie. Uh, and here is uh, Pie the Quest. One afternoon I was in the library of a small town in Mississippi in need of some information. So I went up to the lady behind the desk there. Ahead of me were an elderly white man and a young black woman. The elderly man was saying, just hit me suddenly, you know, that I wanted something. And then, then it hit me what it was that I wanted. It was pie. Well, said the lady behind the desk, a piece of pie. It's funny because usually I don't want pie this time of day. But I did. That's exactly what, I wa what it was that I wanted, a piece of pie. But I couldn't think who would have pie this time of day. Mm-hmm, said the librarian. Ms. Boyd, of course, serves extremely fine pie, but of course Miss Boyd wouldn't be open. I was going to say, said the librarian, this time of day. 
So I said to myself, I said, Now, Walter, where in town would they be liable to know where a body could get a piece of pie? Mm-hmm, said the librarian, looking thoughtful. This time of day, I said, Will I tell you where somebody's liable to know? At the library. <laughs> so I told myself that what I would do would be just to come on over here and I declare, Ms. Owls, Mr. Owsley, librarian raised her voice. I hold her! A faint voice replied from back in the stacks. Uh-huh. Do you know where Mr. Owsley could get a piece of pie? You mean this time of day? <laughs> At that point, the young black woman stepped forward and said, Excuse me, but do you have anything about the Army? Because I got to get out of this damn town. Um, no, let's see. Uh, I got get into compost, and here's something. Let's see. Uh, eating outdoors, eating out of house and home. Why is it that things taste so much better outside? Is a question people are always asking, and unlike most questions people are always asking, like, do you really love me, and what is truth? This question springs from satisfaction. Outdoors, your senses perk up, and the smells of pine, honeysuckle, grass, and wood smoke are like extra spices, sauce of the outdoors, which isn't fattening. And you have so much room in which to eat, a mouthful becomes a heartier proposition. I don't say there is no downside to eating outdoors. My daughter, Ennis, when she lived in San Francisco, reported that it took some of the zest out of a picnic when you saw and were seen by people who were living in the park. Another thing that will mar outdoor e eating sometimes is rowdiness. Once I was attending an outdoor event called the Steeplechase in Nashville, Tennessee, with my friends Slick and Susan Lawson, when a man with no shirt on fell into our lunch, where we had it spread out there on plates on our blanket, and he got up with the bulk of our cold cut sticking to his upper body. <laughs> that was awful. <laughs> it wasn't anybody the Lawsons knew well. I didn't know him at all. <laughs> that wouldn't happen indoors. <laughs> Eating outdoors is something somewhat like going naked outdoors. Animals do it. You know why mayonnaise le déjeuner sur l'herbe is so sexy, don't you? Not just because one of the people in it is outdoors naked. I wouldn't be surprised to learn that half the people in the entire history of French painting are outdoors naked. <laughs> it's because she is outdoors naked eating lunch. Sexy and perfectly natural. Most foodstuffs come from outdoors, and cook fires had to be outside originally. In the scheme of things, more eating goes on outdoors than indoors, even today. The whole of nature is a conjugation of the verb to eat in the active and passive, said Real William Ralph Inge. Uh, take a hike up a hill and get out your ordinarily ordinary sandwich and look around at the bird with its worm, the frog with its fly, and here comes the ants for your crumbs. And what do you think? You think, my, what a good spot on the food chain I lucked into. <laughs> this is a fine sandwich. One thing you want to look out for eating outdoors is that you don't eat bits of the outdoors itself. Park, pine straw, bark, pine straw, dirt. I ate a fly once in some baked beans. Until you have bit down on a live bean-sated fly, don't talk to me about what it's like to have a trashy, greasy taste in your mouth. It lingers. I realized what was happening before my molars quite meshed, but that was too late. Actually, it might have been better if I had briskly chewed and swallowed and then realized, and then realized. But as I say, I realized just before I quite finished biting down, a buzz, some movement. I'll tell you what's good, though, baked beans without a fly in them. <laughs> Eat outdoors. Even the memory of, having eaten a fly, memory of having eaten a fly in them is not enough to put me off outdoor baked beans or deviled eggs or potato salad. My friend Lee Smith, who is from Virginia, says northern people on a picnic take whole things, a whole chicken, a whole loaf of bread. Southern people have to have things that have had things done to them. 
But simple is good, too, outdoors. On the island of Lamu, off the coast of Kenya, a lady named Christabel and I ate just-caught fish, roast, fish roasted whole on the beach on a grid of green twigs. Mm. So you do find a little something in your outdoor food that you wouldn't have found if you and your food had stayed indoors. I'm reminded of a time in a Paris restaurant when I cast a warm eye on a raw oyster on the half shell and saw a tiny wormish life form swimming in the liquid. I called the waiter over, but by the time he arrived, I was unable to point out any swimming thing. Shows no goes. It had evidently succumbed to the lemon juice I had squeezed on the oyster. I addressed a second oyster, and there was another one of those things. I summoned the waiter again, and this time he had to admit that he saw the thing swimming. He shrugged and said, C'est la mer. <laughs> you want to be mindful of what you're eating outdoors. I know a man who is eating potato chips out of a bowl at night in a semi-enclosed picnic area, and somebody said to him, you're bleeding all out of your mouth there. Turned out he had been eating handfuls not only of potato chips, but of light bulb fragments <laughs> from a bulb that had broken in an overhead fixture. That wouldn't have happened if he had been entirely outdoors. Then, too, he had been drinking a great deal. <laughs> he doesn't drink at all now, and that's one of the reasons. Anyway, say you are serving something outdoors and someone complains that there is something unexpected in it, a bee wing or a windblown seed. Here is what you could say. Say le grand air. <laughs> I don't know why there have been so many French references in these remarks so far. Perhaps because... The word picnic comes from the French picanica, as opposed to the English picnic, P-Y-K-N-I-C, which means fat. <laughs> I had rather bring in some counterbalancing balancing Americana. So here are some al fresco cooking hits from, hints from the late Slick Lawson, who was deeply involved in outdoor food affairs, up to and including annual goat roasts featuring goat gumbo, nude swimming, and helicopter accidents. Here are his tenets. Quote, things cooked inside are eaten with elbows up. Things cooked outside, the elbows are on a table. Inside, you stand up and stir. Outside, you bend over and peek. Inside, guests tell you how famous chefs do things. Outside, they tell you how they do things. Inside, they help with the dishes. Outside, they help with the ice. Outside, men want to pick up things, chairs, beer coolers, and your best client's wife. <laughs> Inside, people try to make interesting conversation and are dull. Outside, they remember the most deplorable things you did in the good old days. <laughs> Outside, if you discard a chicken lip or the left front paw of a hamster, someone will tell you that you threw away the best part. Outside, someone you don't much like will leave a dish and follow up with three messages on your answering machine while you are in London. <laughs> outside, it's hard to clean up after dark. Outside, anything that falls to the ground belongs legally to the dog. <laughs> outside, medium rare has a wider latitude. <laughs> after you finish serving from the grill, someone always points out that the fire is just now getting ripe. <laughs> in San Francisco, my daughter Annis taught three-year-old kids who had various handicaps, Down syndrome, deafness, parental sexual abuse, drug addiction in the womb. When the 1989 earthquake hit, her work day was over and she was at home, but many of the kids were still at the school. After the earth stopped moving, the teachers on duty took the kids outside while someone checked to make sure the building wasn't about to collapse. <coughs> it was supper time. The next day, Ennis wanted to give the kids a chance to talk out any traumatized feelings they might have. Okay, she said to her class, now what happened yesterday? We had a picnic, the children exclaimed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, let's see. <clears throat> here, uh, there's something here. This uh, is kind of a political uh, thing. Uh, yeah, a grapefruit moment. When my ball of fire granddaughter, Elsie, was two, I offered her a bite of very crisp bacon, crumbled up in some soft scrambled egg. Her response reminded me how dramatic things taste to a child. Elsie is not finicky, but as an adult would say, she was not herself. 
The daughter had the doctor had diagnosed quote a viral sim- syndrome probably. Something at any rate was causing her to reject foods she usually loves. She was hungry and welcomed the bacon and egg at sight and smell, but when it hit her palate, she looked so pained. As far as she knew, she was still herself, but bacon and egg, perhaps willfully, had lost its savor. Maybe it would never taste good again. Maybe life would be yucky from now on. I remember dis- distantly how much more I used to register and relish a bite of bacon, egg, toast altogether. Unless, of course, I had detected in the egg the least bit of underdone white. In that case, I would display such revulsion that my mother would sigh with a pathos strong enough to counter nearly anything I could muster and say, don't pick at your eggs, son. They're good eggs. And I would acknowledge intellectually and not without a backdraft of guilt that they were good to her. But nothing could make me sense that they were good to me, and therefore my position, though I wouldn't dare put it into words, was to hell with them. And as far as I knew, I was right. I knew it was crucial not to lose touch with gut reaction. I had not yet developed a liberal cast of mind. In the South of the late 1940s, where injustice was hard, but certainly possible, to overlook, I had not begun to awaken politically. Eventually, I did, but not because any disadvantaged person touched my soul. I have thought about this a lot. I believe it was because of grapefruit at David's house. There have been times in my adulthood, hungover times, for instance, when grapefruit was the only thing that tasted right, but not in my early childhood. My parents loved grapefruit. My father put salt on it, which struck me as exactly the wrong way to go. He salted watermelon, too. Cantaloupe, he salted and peppered. Today, I can recommend those seasonings without finding them at all necessary, but back then, they heightened my suspicion that grown-ups were often pretending or being perverse. (laughs) My mother would put sugar on my my grapefruit to get me to eat it, but nope, she gave up on me and grapefruit. My mother and I had some history with regard to eating. To hear her tell it, I refused all nourishment for several years. In desperation, she would tell me that the spoonful of baby food was an airplane coming in to land. My lips were sealed. As I advanced beyond toddling stage, she would go so far as to cut a boxwood switch and lay it next to my plate. I would eat what was put before me or else. The threat of corporal punishment didn't work. In some ways, I was a tough kid. I couldn't make you eat to save my life, she would tell me later. Invocation of, yes, the starving Armenians did not move me. What did they have to do with my prerogatives? Finally, heeding our family doctor's advice, she made herself stop worrying about wasted food or the possibility that I was starving myself to spite her. She backed off, and in due time, I became a trencherman. Today, with pretty much the sole exception of Japanese red bean desserts, I say yes to the comestible universe. I even kind of like fruitcake. Is anything aside from the little hard yellow things intrinsically bad about fruitcake? I suspect that fruitcake hatred is something that broad-minded people can feel all right about sharing. Everybody needs a guilt-free aversion. But a free society is one in which you can't make people do what makes sense, even if it's, even if it's demonstrably good for them, until they, until they are ready, ideally at least. And as a boy, I had a good deal of idealism with regard to myself. What I remember of that early mealtime duress is probably from being told about it. What I richly recall is the free and ready enjoyment of my mother's good cooking. As a result, I lack colorful memories of horrid food avoidance. My wife, Joan, so hated lima beans, they still make her shudder, that she would convey them by sleight of hand to the underside of the drop leaf table and leave them on the little ledge there where she would see their desiccated remains when she looked up during games of hide and seek (laughs) and feel no remorse. But I do remember going over to someone else's house when I was a kid. How different the smells could be and how strange the food. I remember supper at my friend Jack's house. Yum, he said, rice potatoes. This was a concept new to me, but hey, I liked potatoes, baked, boiled, fried, mashed, or all rotten. My childhood friend Sally once mortified her parents at a nice restaurant by robustly telling the waiter, I'll have some turnip greens and some bow taters. 
But the rice potatoes of Jack's mother, in all due respect, were way too salty. I toyed with them, couldn't dig in. And even though I could see the faces of Jack and Jack's mother fall, I knew I was right. It was different at David's house. I spent the night there. At breakfast, there was grapefruit. Ooh, I said, I can't stand grapefruit. There followed, as there well should have, an awkward pause. My mother would have killed me, figuratively, for being so rude. But there was something else in the air. I looked over at David. I mean, I said one boy to another, have you ever tasted grapefruit right after milk? Don't taste it right after milk, then, he said. <laughs> it hit me that I was wrong. Not only had I hurt David's and his parents' feelings, which carried a different weight with me than my mother's did, because theirs did not assert the force of fiat. I had also caught myself nursing a repugnance with unjustifiable pride. A more enlightened gut response began to dawn. I could ride with difference, with strangeness even, into a more bountiful life. That little experience, experience may not strike you as dramatic enough to be seminal. For that matter, you may doubt the sensitivity of my granddaughter's taste buds when I tell you that two days after her betrayal by bacon and eggs, I caught her licking the screen door. <laughs> she didn't go yuck, she didn't go yum. She appeared to be filing a sensation away without fear or favor. At a girl, said the grapefruit. <laughs> so, well, we're moving along. Let me then, uh, uh, one other thing that I, other form of food that I hold the line against is foam. Things like mushroom foam. What's the point of that? <laughs> what, how do you make mushroom? What, you get mushroom juice? It's ridiculous. Uh, <clears throat> but here's the way folks are meant to eat, according to the way I grew up. Uh, people I grew up with talked while they ate about what they were eating. When several sides and generations of a family of such folks sat down together around a table with 10 or 12 generous platters in front of them, they sounded something like this. And us to thy service. Amen. Pitch in. I don't know where to start first. Mm -mm. Big Mama has outdone herself tonight. Well, I just hope y'all can enjoy it. <laughs> I believe I could eat a horse. Would you look at them tomatoes? Ooh, don't they look good? Now, Tatum, slow down. You let that child enjoy himself. Well, you didn't think you think we didn't feed him at home. He didn't get any snap beans. Lord, pass that child some snap beans. Lila, how about you over there? You need something more? Butter beans. Ooh, Len, no, I'm working on this corn. Come on, just a dab. Well, you talked me into it. Mmm. <laughs> Awful early to be getting this good of corn. Eunice, would you send that okra back around? Look at me, just a putting it away. I'm eating like a field hen. A little more tea to wash it down. Mmm. Mmm. These greens. Anybody want anything? I will have one more happen to that squash if nobody minds. It's so good. A little cornbread to stop that juice. One more mouthful of ham. Then I do have to stop, sure enough. Look at all this chicken left. Have a little more there, Charles. Oh, where would he put it? Yes, I'm in, in, in just a spoonful of that gravy to put on my peas. Charles, we didn't raise you to mix your gravy with your peas. See you now. You let that child eat the way he likes it. Mmm, mmm, mmm. More rolls, anybody? Uh, I think this is all I can hold. You better eat some more of this good chicken. No, I'm, I got to save room for pie. Pie? There's pie. Oh, listen, pie. <laughs> now, Needy, you know good and well we wouldn't let you go home and tell people we didn't serve you any pie. Look at that pie. What is in this pie? This pie is so good. Um, mm. How do you get your crust to do like this, Big Mama? My crust won't do like this. Oh, your crust does fine. Mmm. Mmm. -hmm. Mm. 
Well, I have eaten myself sick. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that good? I don't think I could touch another bite. I'm about to pop. Mm. Yes, Lord. Them tomatoes are especially good. Got plenty more now I could slice right up. No, no, I'd die. So, any questions about what we have covered so far? What about bacon? What about bacon? I've got a song <laughs> to bacon here, and the best way to get it is to buy this book. <laughs> oh, man. That's it. You wrote a column a while back for uh, Garden and Gun about uh, dogs, in which you sort of bemoan the fact that because you're on the road a lot, you can't own one. But at the end, there was a little bit of hope about your wife was going to go look at a Certain breed. I'm wondering whether you got one. Uh, Havanese. You Havanese know, yeah. is right. Yeah. No, we still haven't gotten a dog. And now we have a cat named Jimmy who, uh, you know, Jimmy would have to approve of the dog as well. And, uh, <laughs> Jimmy just barely approves of me. So. <laughs> Jimmy is a wonderful cat. And uh, that's what we, he's what we have instead of a dog. I've been thinking about doing a book about Jimmy, except I don't think we need another book about a cat. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, in the making of Wait, Wait, are you given time to make up the bluff the listener responses? Yeah. The, uh, everything wait, wait, that the panelists do is off the cuff, except for the, the bluff the listener thing. They mm -hmm. tell us that the, night, the topic the night before, mm -hmm. and we write it up. I write it up on the plane. Come. And uh, also the prediction. They tell us the, the topic of the prediction just okay. before we go on the stage. So uh, the whole time I'm trying to win the ridiculous game, which I <laughs> hate not doing. Uh, I'm trying to think of what my prediction is. So those are two, two pre, you know, the only, only warnings we have are those two things. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Yeah. It, it, in the this is the first time I've ever had a follow-up question. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm from New York. So there you yeah. go. No, that's so it, in the years you've been making Wait, Wait, what are some of the high notes for you? Well, uh, y'all all heard that. What's the high, high notes in the years I've been making uh, Wait, Wait? Um, uh, well, I, I enjoy uh, Barack Obama when he was a senator, was a guest. And uh, he uh, uh, said um, that he was surprised to see when he, when he first showed up at the Senate that uh, Every senator had a little wooden desk, like in grammar school, old-time grammar school, and senators over the centuries had carved their names into the, their desks. And I said, um, uh, are you supposed to do that? And he said, uh, as the only uh, African-American senator, uh, I thought I might spray paint my name. <laughs> he, he was a great guest. Um, uh, you know, there have been uh, there have been times when I won the game. Though, those were high points. So. <laughs> and every time I get a word in edgewise, actually, is I, there's like, it's not ideally suited to my uh, pace because if you pause, you know, a little bit, bang, oh, pause there. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Uh, any other questions? Uh, well, uh, one last yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Calvin Trillin once said that going to a white-run barbecue was like going to a Gentile internist. Right. That 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 it, it that it might turn out okay, but you've made no attempt to take advantage of the percentages. That's right. That, how, how do you how do you feel about that? I think that, that is one of the great statements of American food writing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that and the fact that a book has the an average book has the uh, shelf life of cream cheese. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's most certain too. I mean, I, I, it's not in here. There's a, I wrote a piece about Augusta, Georgia that's in one of my other books uh, and talked to some uh, 
African American people who were making, who were cooking barbecue, and they were had, were cooking it one day and they let it season overnight before they ate it. And they said they were talking about uh, some white people who had just sort of jiffied up some barbecue and said, he "said that's just like white people to eat green meat." <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what you think of uh, how cool Southern food's become in the last uh, 15 years or so. Yeah, Southern, uh, uh, my hometown of Decatur, Georgia, has become cooler than, uh, I, uh, you know, you, when you go back to your hometown, you're supposed to sort of chuckle. Oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're still driving, uh, you know, was, uh, they haven't really started to, uh, they don't know about the internet down here yet, no, you know, but, uh, but my uh, hometown has become much cooler than I have, and uh, they have, uh, they, I went to a restaurant there called the Iberian Pig, which is, uh, yeah, but, so Decatur now is full of all sorts of uh, uh, way beyond southern food, but southern food itself has moved up to Brooklyn, you know, you get de deviled eggs, and in fact, I have a thing here, one of the pieces in here is called uh, Ironic Biscuits, question mark, which is all about all about a biscuit place in, uh, actually it's in Manhattan, I guess, that's, uh, that serves special biscuit specials with things like banana pudding on them, which is just ridiculous. Uh, so yeah, it's all, to my, all sorts of things that, uh, uh, pimento cheese, pimento cheese, which was the, was the last thing to move north, has now moved north and has, has become, uh, you know, on the, if you ever watch Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul, pimento cheese pops up from time to time. Because Mike, you know, Mike, the uh, the old bald-headed uh, uh, muscle guy, you know, bodyguard guy, uh, never carries a gun. He just carries a little bag of lunch, which has a pimento cheese sandwich in it. <laughs> I trace the, the the evolution of the pimento cheese sandwich through uh, through the movies. It's in a couple of movies too. And if every, in every case. There was no reference to any pimento cheese sandwich in, in the popular culture that I could find um, until uh, till the, the internet started spreading it around. Now you can find the top 10 pimento cheese sandwiches in New York City, <laughs> stories about it in New York Magazine. But for a long time it just came up occasionally. So you can find out about that in here too. Anybody else? Well, Thank you. Thank you to Roy Blount, Jr.